So uh, hi everyone, and thank you all for joining this webcast. Uh, my name is Michal Levin, and I'm a user experience designer for over uh, nine years now. Uh, my topic for today is designing multi-device experiences, or as I often like to put it, does size matter? Uh, and specifically, I, I would like to talk about designing a product across multiple devices with different screen sizes, form factors, and so on, but all part of the same ecosystem. Uh, and this notion of e ecosystem, meaning offering your product across multiple connected devices, all interacting with one another and wirelessly sharing data, this notion is super, super important for our discussion. Uh, and the reason is that, you know, all these devices around us, they relate to one another in a variety of ways. And together as a system, they can, they can form really powerful ensembles that can better assist and delight people on their day-to-day -day tasks and activities. And this is really what this uh, pr presentation is all about today. So uh, before I drill down to the detailed agenda for today, uh, just a few brief words about myself. Uh, so what you see here is a um, high-level uh, UX uh, timeline uh, of my journey so far. Uh, so just uh, starting from now, uh, for the last four years, I've been working at Google. Uh, I joined Google in 2009 uh, and became the first UX designer in Google Israel. Uh, about two and a half years later, I moved to the headquarters here in uh, Mountain View. Uh, and during my time uh, at Google, uh, I've led the UX design in a variety of uh, product areas uh, like analytics and data visualization, search, uh, business application, security, and, and others. Uh, in, in parallel, when I moved to the Bay, I also joined AppWest, uh, which is a, uh, a startup accelerator, uh, and became their UX mentor. Uh, prior to Google, I worked as a UX uh, a specialist at uh, Modu, which was a very, very interesting uh, company that uh, developed an innovative type of mobile ecosystem. And I do have to say that during that time, I really got hooked on ecosystem and pretty much never really let go since then. Uh, and before that, uh, I worked for about three and a half years at uh, Tour as a senior UX expert uh, uh, and worked there um, on a bunch of projects in various areas. So that's briefly about me. Uh, I guess the latest and greatest uh, is this uh, baby chameleon. Uh, which is just about to see the light of day in less than a week. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, and the presentation that you will hear today is basically the backbone for this book. Uh, but of course, the book includes, you know, much more information and analysis and study cases and discussions and so on and so forth. So I hope you will find it useful. Uh, and with that, let's look at what on the agenda for today. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start off by uh, giving you a taste of Rachel's English trifle pie uh, as a basis for discussion about ecosystem design. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the multi-device revolution, uh, which stands for the uh, growing number and diversity of devices in our day-to-day -day life, uh, and also the interconnections between them. Uh, then we'll take a deep dive into the three main building blocks of multi-device experience uh, design, uh, what I like to call the three C's, consistent, continuous, and complementary. Uh, we're going to get a little bit of help from uh, Seinfeld with that. Uh, and just to wrap up, uh, we're going to summarize all the main takeaways of this talk. So uh, everyone has a key line that they chose uh, from the video, because I definitely have one. And my favorite line here uh, is this one. That tastes like feet. And, and you know, I'm sorry to be blunt here, but what I love about this, this line and about this entire video, uh, beyond the fact that I've seen it like 1,200 times by now and it still makes me laugh, uh, is just how well it expresses the underlying idea behind ecosystem thinking. And that is that it's not enough to have a mix of good ingredients. You really, really need to make sure that they work well together as a whole. because Otherwise, mm, the whole thing might think. Um, and just you know, to give you a sense of how powerful this uh, multi-device revolution is, 
Uh, I collected a few numbers, you know, about the present and uh, about uh, the near future. And as you look through all these numbers, uh, what you can see that they basically reinforce what we already acknowledge around us. And that is that smartphones are everywhere and tablet sales are skyrocketing and wearables are quickly uh, penetrating the consumer's market and the internet of things is just around the corner. And what this all means uh, from UX perspective, well, it actually means a lot of things, but I think that the underlying takeaway, you know, that is the basis for much of the rest is the following. People already own multiple devices, PCs, smartphones, tablets, TVs, and more. And not only that, they are already using them together uh, in conjunction, switching be between them in a variety of ways in order to accomplish a single goal. And, you know, this multi-device uh, usage is already taking place, and we are behind. Uh, if, if you look at most of the products today, they all still offer the same experience across all devices. And, of course, they make, you know, minor adjustments uh, for device-specific size and form factor. But still, for many people, multi-device design is equivalent to responsive design, which is actually uh, a very partial view of what multi-device experiences really are. And we'll get to that. Uh, and also, just to put these uh, numbers in perspective, um, just know that already today, the number of uh, connected devices uh, exceed uh, the number of people and toothbrushes in the world. Uh, the, mo the mobile app revenue already reached two, uh, 26 billion in, in 2013, which is more than, tw than, than twice the amount of money that we need in order to feed the entire world undernourished. Uh, and the uh, uh, monthly app downloads, which is more than one billion a month uh, in every app store, which is the, the app store and Google Play, um, is already nine times greater than McDonald's sells burgers. And, you know, if you're still not convinced about the power of this uh, multi-device world, well, then there are already memes about it. And, you know, that has to give the final stamp of a true phenomenon. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, let's get right to business and talk design. So please meet our uh, four core devices, uh, which will accompany us uh, throughout this entire presentation. And this is, of course, the smartphone, the tablet, the PC, and the TV. Uh, these are the most popular and widely used devices today, so I will rely mostly on them to explain the different design approaches. Uh, at the same time, please note that multi-device experiences are definitely not limited to just these devices. And actually, they get much more interesting as you think beyond them, you know, about a fully connected world, internet of things, and, and all of that. And, you know, as I go through the uh, presentation, I will give a few examples of that as we move along. So, um, uh, I would like to officially introduce you now uh, with the design framework, uh, which I call the three Cs, consistent, continuous, and complementary. And it's important to understand that at the root of this framework is the important realization that uh, along with different devices, uh, people's needs, behaviors, user, uh, usage patterns, and settings also change and route to their goal. So let's take a look at each one more deeply and understand what it means. And we're going to start with the consistent. So what is consistent experience? Uh, consistent experience, which is the most common multi-device approach uh, applied today, refers to basically having the same essential experience with the same content and feature set uh, ported across devices in a like manner. Now, this doesn't mean that the experience is 100% 100 identical between devices. It can't and it shouldn't be uh, because, you know, some adjustments have to be made in order to accommodate different device um, characteristics like screen size and input method, interaction model, and sensors. Uh, but still, overall, the same core experience is available and pretty much the same on any device, anytime, anywhere. So uh, let's see a few examples that, that would uh, better clarify what we mean. So my first example is actually Google Search. And I think Google Search is a really great example of the idea that even with the you know cleanest simplest user interface, good consistent design uh, is not identical across devices. 
So, you know, if you look at uh, these three devices, you can see that uh, the design is very similar. You know, the screen layout in this case, it's the big Google logo and the search bar is kept consistent across all devices. Also, after you run a search, the search result uh, layout is also the same across devices. Uh, also, as you can see, the visual design is also the same, which keeps the same branding across different devices. At the same time, if you look more carefully on the mobile devices, and I'm, and I'm talking about the, uh, the smartphone and the tablet, you will notice that for both of them, um, Google surfaces more prominently alternative input methods like voice and camera. And, you know, if you think about it, touch-based devices, and especially as they get smaller in size, make it much, much harder to type. It's, it's error-prone, it takes a lot of time. So by surfacing more prominently, a voice search can really facilitate how you can search. In addition, if you think about the smartphone, for example, you know, people carry it everywhere they go. So it's always on them. So, you know, when you travel to new places or just like, you know, walking around, uh, you often come across interesting landmarks or objects that, you know, you'd like to know more about. And in this case, actually articulating a keyword-based search uh, is not necessarily easy because you don't necessarily know what you're looking at. So being able to just, you know, pull out your phone, take out, the, you know, and just launch the camera and take a picture, run a simple photo-triggered search uh, would be very hel helpful in these use cases, which, of course, are not as relevant for the desktop. So this is just an example of how we can, you know, make some adjustments uh, based on the specific device trait in order to accommodate the, the different use cases and use patterns of that device. So that's the first example. The second example is uh, Trulia. And for those of you who are not familiar with this product, uh, it's an online real estate product for home buyers and sellers and renters and real estate professionals. And it lists uh, uh, properties for sale and for rent, as well as uh, a lot of neighborhood information and community insights. Um, so if you look at this main map view across all devices, uh, it's a really nice example for a classic consistent approach. And as you can see, uh, it clearly shows the progressive disclosure of content as screens get bigger uh, while keeping the same core experience across the board. So, you know, the underlying key element, which is, the map and the price bubbles and the search bar and of course the list of properties is consistent across all displays. But still there is a different treatment based on the device size. So if we look at the, at the smallest device, the smartphone, it only has the map and the price bubbles and everything else is upon interaction. So I have to, you know, tap a price bubble and then I get more information about that property. As we move to the bigger device like the tablet where we have more real estate, we can actually put, you know, a property list already on display. So some properties are surfaced by default at the bottom. And then if I, if I tap any of them, I get additional information. So there is a little bit of a different interaction here, but still the basic layer is the same. And as I move to the biggest device, which is the desktop, so I have, you know, even more uh, um, screen space. So there is a whole left, uh, strip that includes advanced filters and neighborhood information and more properties by default. And again, the interaction is adjusted accordingly. So if I click on a price bubble on the map, the list on the left, uh, it, it scrolls right to that property and shows me details about that. So, you know, similarly to uh, the previous example, we see the same core experience with some minor adjustments per device. The last example that I would like to give is Hulu Plus. So Hulu, as you probably know, is a free website uh, subscri subscription service uh, that is currently available only in Japan and the US. Uh, and it offers as supported on-demand uh, streaming video of you know, TV shows, movies, clips, uh, trailers, and, and other media. Uh, Hulu Plus is their paid version. Uh, and it adds not only expanded content labor, content library, but, but also a wide range of platforms that, that you can watch that content, including Blu-rays and TiVos and TVs, smartphones, tablets, and, and game consoles. So again, as you can see, Hulu Plus offers the same content and feature sets across all devices, as well as the same visual treatment. So we have this big, 
hero image at the top that is persistent across all devices. And then underneath, we have uh, a bunch of uh, content and videos uh, that are promoted based on different categories. So uh, in terms of adaptation, of course, based on the screen size, we see that uh, it shifts from uh, a four column display in the desktop, and then it narrows down to a two column display on the tablet and a one column display on the smartphone. Also uh, on the smartphone, because it has, it has much less uh, screen real estate, uh, the navigation model is deeper. So you need to uh, go deeper and have more uh, levels of navigation because you can't surface all these layers uh, at the same level, which again is a common practice when it comes to the small size devices. So my question is, you know, we have like all these really nice uh, UI designs and great experiences, but I, I'm, I'm still asking myself over and over again, can we go any further? Can we do better? And my answer is yes, we can. And the reason is that um, consistent experience, you know, it provides access to everything, anywhere, anytime, which is a huge advantage. Again, it's a great first step when we think about m m multiple devices. At the same time, consistent experience overlooks a couple of critical factors. The first one is context. And by context, I mean delivering the right thing at the right time. So, you know, you don't necessarily need everything all the time. Sometimes you just want the right thing at the right time. And this is actually something that can simplify the experience and allow you to consume content and do things better. The second thing is multi-device relationships. So as I said earlier, devices relate to one another and they can supplement and support each other. And people are already starting to use devices in conjunction and switching between them. So this, you know, multi-device connections are already taking place. And consistent experience by offering everything everywhere is basically device agnostic. Because it doesn't matter which device you pick up, you get everything. Uh, the third um, uh, thing, which is related to the previous one, is the fact that it doesn't account for the best available device for the task. Again, all devices offer everything. Doesn't really think which device I have available and which one can provide me with the best experience and leverage on that. And the last thing, uh, which is definitely not the least, as we're looking into the future, and it's not you know, a far away future, consistent experience make it hard to scale the experience to a fully connected world that goes beyond the core devices. And this is what is known you know, as the internet of things, where everything is going to be connected and, you know, even if you look today, just today at the existing wearables, for example, like smartwatches and smart glasses, you, you quickly realize that even these devices can no longer allow to just replicate the, the, the experience. Uh, these, these devices have super small uh, screen size, um, like 1.6 inch for most uh, smartwatches, for example. And they also carry other interaction limitations that really require to strip down the experience to the very core and use very, very simple screen layouts, like, you know, one big visual object and like big font. And this, this actually means that a very important part of the design process is crystallizing the wearable role in the bigger constellation of devices and the relationship between this device and the other devices in the ecosystem. And it's really about defining what each device is best at and what each device should handle based on the different context of use uh, versus the parts that other devices should, should take on and thinking about how they can all provide together as a whole an optimal experience for the user. And to accommodate all of these, we need to take a look at two additional design approaches that are context-driven. So let's continue and, and look at those. So the second uh, design approach is what I call continuous experience. Let's understand what continuous experience means. So basically with, with continuous experience, the experience is shifted be, be, between devices and one device passes the torch to another device to continue the user's experience. And this continuation can take uh, two forms. It can either continue the same action, like you know, starting to watch a movie on one device and continuing on another device that is more convenient, or it can actually get more sophisticated and 
continue through a sequence of actions that are different and they take place in different contexts, but still they all belong to the same flow. So let's have a look at a few examples which would clarify it better. So uh, my first example is Amazon Kindle. And uh, thanks to the WhisperSync uh, te technology, uh, um, Amazon ensures a, a seamless reading experience across m multiple Kindles and Kindle apps. So what it does is basically uh, or automatically syncs your books across apps. Uh, so you can you know, start reading on one device and continue where you left off on another device. So, you know, you can start reading your book on the train ride home. Uh, and then if later you're meeting a friend at the cafe and you need to wait for them, you can, you know, take out your phone and continue there. And if you wait at the doctor, you can continue there. So, again, a, a continuous experience uh, of the same activity. Um, not only that, one clever thing that Amazon also did is to integrate with Audible.com, which provides audio support for the book. So what it actually means that you can either read or listen to the book being read to you. And this really uh, stretches the continuous experience to additional context of use, like, you know, while running or driving or just, you know, lying in bed with the lights turned off. So really like stepping back and thinking about the goal and what you're trying to help people do and thinking about new uh, creative ways that we can do today, thanks to all the te te technological uh, capabilities is really powerful in, uh, uh, in this type of experiences. So that's one example. A similar example is Google Chromecast, uh, which allows you to basically start watching uh, a video or a movie on one device and continue on a different one. So where is it useful? In many cases, for example, let's say that you take uh, the bus home and you have a long uh, ride, so you can start watching a movie on your smartphone because that, that's the device that you have with you. But as you get home, you can just cast that movie exactly where you left off to the big screen TV and enjoy a much better and improved experience with better sound and, you know, bigger screen and, you know, complete the movie there. So that's another example of the same activity. The third example that I would like to talk to you about is, um, is the second type where we actually talk about uh, a continuation of different action, progressing through different actions but all part of the same use case. And I think that All Recipes is a great example for that. Uh, and how they, ha they, they handle their end-to-end -end, uh, cooking experience is really one of those things that I've, I've found in the last, I think, like five or so years that I've been working uh, in this realm of really like making people get this aha moment where they see how powerful um, uh, contextual treatment of multi-device experience can get. So, let me explain how it works. So let's say, you know, that you want to cook dinner for friends on Friday night, right? So if we break down this, you know, this, this need to the different steps, we get uh, as the first step just the need to decide what you want to cook. So this is what I call the research phase or the information seeking phase where you basically want to go and search for recipes and read about them and user comments and ingredients and how hard or easy it is and what goes well with what. And this is where you would usually prefer to use a bigger screen just because it's much more convenient uh, to sit in front of the big screen and see all the results and search and get like a better display of, of everything. And it usually also requires time. So uh, for that, our recipes offer both a desktop UI as well as a, a tablet app where you can do all this uh, searching and researching. So, you know, you did that uh, and you searched and you read and you thought with yourself and your spouse, you know, what you want to cook, and you decided on a set of, you know, recipes. So all recipes, uh, what they also offer you is this feature called my recipe list. And this is where the interesting part starts. Once you decide what you want to cook and you add those recipes to, to the recipe list, what all recipes do, they automatically extract all the ingredients from all the recipes and syncs it with your iPhone immediately creating a really nicely designed shopping list with all the ingredients. And it's already categorized by the different departments, you know, dairy and food and vegetables and so on and so forth. And again, it's, it, it comes from the basic realization that the next step in the process is going to be to go to the grocery store and buy all these ingredients. So instead of having you take a piece of paper and write down everything and, you know, worrying about forgetting stuff or even like 
getting another app, a, a to-do list, and writing your shopping list. They do it all for you. They, they understand what is going to come next. And on that next step, you're probably not going to have your tablet with you or your desktop. And, and, and even if you do, you're not going to open them up, uh, you know, in the middle of the supermarket. A much more useful device is going to be the smartphone. And this is where you have, like, the best design shopping list. So uh, you go to the supermarket and you do all your grocery uh, um, shopping and you check off, you know, the, the items on the list and you come back home. Great. What are you going to do now? You actually need to cook all this food. So uh, this is where all recipes uh, uh, tapped into the um, organically em emerging trend where um, tablets are used very often for cooking as cooking aids. So they created this really nice app where you see, you know, like a cooking uh, book UI with a timer and the list of, ex of uh, ingredients and, and you have the different steps and it is highlighted. And you as a user can just like switch to the other device, to the tablet and start cooking. And this is where it shows that again, like taking a use case like cooking, which is a more complex use case that has uh, uh, a bunch of steps in it and kind of like stepping back, understanding the different contexts that each step of the process takes place at and adapting the UI per device to that context makes it a very seamless and powerful experience. And the nice thing about it is that as you start to realize that and you really start to notice these things and think about them, you discover that you can actually break down the experience to even more stages. So uh, w one example that, you know, that, that I immediately thought about was, you know, this shopping list is great and all, but uh, one uh, drawback is that I might have some of the ingredients at home and all recipes don't know that, right? They just give me like all the ingredients in, you know, full quantity as appeared in the recipe. But if you think a step ahead, you know, soon enough our fridges and our cabinets and everything is going to be connected, right, with sensors. So when that happens, our recipes can relatively easily, at least conceptually, in terms of the design, connect these devices to the ecosystem. And then these can report, you know, report back uh, what I already have in my fridge and in my cabinet, and they can deduct it from the shopping list. So again, this experience, as great as it is, it can actually get better and better. And as you think about all the opportunities of this connected world, you can actually come up with awesome ideas of how things can be even better and change behavior patterns even more. So that's all recipes. Uh, the last example that, that I would like to talk to you about in this uh, design approach is something that goes a little bit uh, further and kind of like gives you a taste of how we can bridge the physical and the digital world. So I don't know how many of you heard about it, but uh, Tesco um, uh, uh, established this uh, virtual supermarket in a subway uh, station in South Korea. So what you see in front of you is actually uh, a picture of items that are basically just pictures that are lined up against a digital wall. And users, you know, people, while they wait for the train, they can just go next to it and kind of like scan the QR code next to each item and complete their grocery shopping. So what starts on a physical wall, you know, in the train station, continues into the phone where the entire transaction takes place, where you build up your shopping cart, you check out, uh, and then it goes back to the physical world by having all the items that you ordered delivered to your home by the end of the day. So it not only fills up uh, the waiting time in a very effective way, it also saves people the need to stop, for example, at an intermediate um, like station to go and do the grocery shopping. So it really like gets into uh, people's daily journeys and understand the different like time slots in their day and leveraging on that in a very clever way. So that's another example of how far and uh, continuous experiences can go. Okay. Uh, the last design approach that I would like to talk to you about uh, that tackles a bit of a different set of use cases is the complementary design approach. So let's understand what it means. Um, com complementary experience um, is where multiple devices actually work together as an ensemble to create the full experience. So uh, while the previous examples uh, and the previous experience types like the continuous and the consistent experience relied on uh, people interacting with one device at a time. 
In this case, people interact with multiple devices at the same time. And it's usually at the same place, so it doesn't have to be this way, as we will see. Now, uh, in this type of design approach, uh, you can have two main forms of relationship between devices, collaboration and control. When I say collaboration, uh, I mean that different devices work together as equal partners uh, that contribute to the overall experience. That's collaboration. Control is when the main experience takes place on a certain device and another device controls different aspects of it. So again, let's have a look at uh, a couple of examples that will better clarify what I mean. Uh, the first example is uh, Real Racing 2, uh, the party play mode, uh, which is based on uh, Apple's AirPlay te technology and allows uh, uh, multiple players to play together in front of the TV using their, you know, uh, iPhone 4S, iPad 2, and Apple TV. And what is so beautiful about this experience, and I'm going to put aside for a second the fact that uh, Apple is a closed uh, garden and all of that part, I, I want to concentrate on the concept. And the concept here is utilizing people's existing devices and the fact that they carry them with them all the time to really allow them to take part uh, in, a, in a social experience and, and play together in front of the TV. So you don't need to buy a proprietary game console. You don't need to be tied to cords. Just, you know, people live their life and move between places and just with the same device, they can repurpose it to different activities along the day. So that's one example. I do have to say that uh, uh, complementary uh, experiences are especially well suited for social or group experiences. So in the book, I talk about a lot of other like uh, social game experiences like uh, Scrabble and iPad Racer and other games that can really benefit uh, from multi-device uh, connection. The second example, which actually doesn't necessarily require multiple players, is scale dartboard. And this is just like a lovely, simple uh, experience that is based on two apps. So you have the, uh, the app for the iPad, which uh, transform it uh, into a dartboard. And you have an app for the phone that uh, um, holds the dart. And what you do, you, you aim your phone to your new dartboard you give it a quick shake and you basically watch as your doubt is thrown uh, uh, from your phone onto the iPad. And you know, these apps use uh, Bluetooth and accelerometer data in order to um, de determine how well you did. But overall, as you can see, you need both devices at the same time in order to create the full experiences. And I have to say that I'm not sure that, you know, the day is far when this will replace the dartboard in bars and stuff like the real dartboard. It's actually pretty fun uh, and not dangerous at all. So it's, it's a pretty cool uh, experience. The third example that I would like to talk to you about is actually an example of a whole uh, type of uh, complementary experience that is uh, catching speed very fast. Um, TV Tag, which was uh, formerly Get Glue. Uh, to those of you who are familiar with this app, uh, is an example of a second screen experience, which is basically a, a companion app on the smartphone while watching a show on TV. So what TV tags offer you is that, you know, when a TV show starts, uh, you can check into the show that you're currently watching, and then you get to see the most uh, buzzworthy uh, TV moments uh, as picked by TV tags uh, staff of curators. So TV Tag actually employs uh, more than 50 curators that watch live TV feeds, you know, live social feeds from a total of 70 networks, I think. Uh, and they identify in real time the most uh, interesting TV moments, which means important scenes and key quotes and goal shots uh, and more. And then the app lets you uh, comment on these TV moments, uh, create memes out of them, and even doodle on them. And of course, you can share everything with your friends. So basically what you get here is a multi-device experience that enhances the traditional TV watching one. Now, what is interesting to note uh, about this uh, specific experience type is that uh, as opposed to the previous examples where as a uh, product owner or product developer, you actually needed to develop the app for all the different devices in order to create an ecosystem, in this case, you really only need to develop a single app because what it does is basically taking the smartphone 
where you, you, you develop an app for and tie it to a real TV event, whether it's a live event or a broadcasted event. And from user's perspective, they get an ecosystem experience. But for you as a product developer, you only work on one, uh, on one side of the experience. So this might sound uh, to many of you as you know, the dream ecosystem, at least from a developer's point of view, uh, because you just build a single mobile app, you tie it to a TV event, and there you go, an ecosystem ex experience much cheaper and less resources required. So this is true, uh, but at the same time, just keep in mind that what's easy for you is also easy for others. So we actually already see uh, an abundance of uh, second screen apps out there uh, from different providers. Uh, and even just like in the last Super Bowl and even in last year's Super Bowl, uh, I found at least like 15 different second screen apps just for that event. So I think that's what is important to think about when you uh, do think about this kind of experiences is how to build it as a platform uh, and not necessarily tied to just a specific event because it kind of narrows down how much you can scale with that. But that's just like one thing to think about. Uh, the fourth example that I would like to talk to you about is the one uh, is one that shows the uh, the second type of relationship that we talked about. So all the the, the three examples that we talked about so far were all collab collaborative examples where the different devices all take part in the experience in the same way and together as a group they they create the full experience. Uh, Slingbox is the first example where one device controls another device. So um, what you see here on an Android ecosystem is uh, a Slingbox box that is connected to the TV. And once you install the, uh, the Sling player on any other device, whether it's the smartphone, the tablet, or the, uh, or the PC, uh, you can watch and control your home TV from these devices. So, you know, uh, it can be just like, turning your smartphone into a remote control and changing the volume and the channels. But an even more uh, interesting use case is uh, when you can control things remotely for real. And what I mean by that is, you know, if I take like myself, for example, you know, I'm a huge, huge Glee fan. And, you know, I might find myself, you know, I go out with friends and um, one evening and then I, I'm, I'm suddenly realizing, oh, my God, there is Glee in like three minutes. So all I need to do is take out my phone and use that app to set it for record. Like I don't need to do anything else and I can just use the device that I already have on me in order to do that. So what it shows is that while most of the complementary experiences uh, take place at the same time at the same place, it doesn't have to be this way. And you can actually stretch the experience beyond that and it doesn't have to be synchronous. So I can actually control my TV, for example, or other devices, as we will soon see, by being completely remote and controlling that from where, wherever I am. And with that, I want to continue to the last example in this uh, type of design experiences. And this is where I kind of want to stretch the, um, the thinking a little bit and extend the family. So what you see here is two examples from the um, initial uh, examples of Internet of Things. So on the right, you see Nest, uh, which you probably heard of, a beautiful, beautiful thermostat uh, that you can control remotely through your smartphone. So similarly to Slingbox, let's say that I leave the house, get to the office, and suddenly I'm not sure if I turned off, you know, the, 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 the air conditioner. I can just take out my phone and I can turn it off. I can change the temperature if I want. I can do all kinds of controlling uh, um, actions on the thermostat. So that's one example. The second example that again opens up a whole promising realm from multi-device experiences is the medical one. So while this um, product at the top left may seem like a karaoke uh, set, it's actually nothing like that. Uh, it's the world's first uh, smartphone-based ultrasound imaging system. Uh, and it's for doctors, you know, it's not for, um, for uh, end consumers. But still, once you think about the stuff you can do and how you can leverage the computing power of smartphones, it's really like mind-blowing how far you can go with it. And this also shows how you can actually physically 
like utilize connection between devices and, uh, and really offer new type of experiences that can better serve use cases that couldn't have met before. Um, so with that, uh, I want to go back and summarize what we saw. So we talked about three design approaches, consistent, continuous, and complementary. And I kind of explained each one in isolation, so it's, it's clear what each one mean, means. But now that we have a better understanding of each design approach, I do want to highlight that they are not really discrete types. And in fact, it's not about choosing, you know, which design approach out of the three best fits your product ecosystem. It's more about how you integrate them. Because more often than not, you actually need to integrate um, multiple design approaches in the same experience. And um, the three C's should actually be, um, be looked at as a toolbox for approaching multi-device experiences. Um, and before you can actually choose, you know, which tools you would like to use, you need to go back to the basic questions. And in order to decide which kind of design approaches work for your product, uh, as with any good UX design, uh, you need to focus on the user and you need to ask yourself the following questions. The first one is, again, as with any UX design project, what are the user's needs and goals that your product ecosystem tries to address? You first need to understand that before you even think about devices. What are we trying to solve? Um, then you need to analyze what are the main flows and use scenarios involved in this product ecosystem. So really understanding the flows and the context of use that people go through as they use or going to use your product ecosystem. Only when you have that in place, you can start thinking which experience approaches can best accommodate these needs within each flow and between use contexts. Because again, in different use cases, you might need uh, different design approaches because they meet different kind of needs. So really like analyze after you have all the flows and the context, which type of design approach can best fit each context. And only when you have all of that, this is when you go back to the devices and ask yourself which devices should be used uh, in each context and what are the roles in each of these contexts. So really crystallizing, you know, which device best fit uh, which context and which design approach. And uh, I just want to go back and kind of like, uh, after we saw some examples to reiterate uh, two of the examples that we talked about before to uh, further cl clarify how these things integrate. So just a few minutes ago, I talked about Nest. And Nest was a fantastic example for a complementary experience where the phone controls the thermostat. But if you look more carefully, you will actually see that it combines both complementary approach and consistent approach. And the consistency comes into play with the peripheral devices that control the thermostat. So the tablet and the phone and the PC all share the same consistent experience. They have the same UI design or the same core experience, and they can all control Nest. Uh, and what it allows users is to actually have multiple entry points to controlling that thermostat. So if you don't own a tablet, you can use the phone. Or if you don't, you know, if you're uh, home and next to your computer, uh, you can do it on the computer. So it basically expands the flexibility in the control opportunities. So that's one example. Uh, if we go back to all recipes, uh, I use all recipes as a really good example for continuous experience, which is true. But at the same time, they didn't, um, you know, rigidly split the experience between devices. We have to remember that this whole like multi-device uh, ex experiences uh, uh, realm is very new. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure it out and people are still trying to understand part of like when they need to use what and when. And as part of that, we need to be, uh, we need to um, admit that and understand what that means in terms of design. So it means that at least for the core essential part of the experience, you probably want to offer it across all the devices. What you can play with is how much prominence you give it or, you know, how it is surfaced among the different UIs. But what we see here, all recipes, it's very hot. It's bread and butter is the list of recipes. This is like the core of the product. 
So this core is offered across all devices, whether it's the tablet, it's the desktop, or the phone. And you can actually understand why, because we need to remember that the phone, for example, is always on you, and it's usually used as a time filler. When you stand in line, when you, you know, take a ride home, whatever, you can watch a movie, but you can also browse through a list of recipes, or you can read your, um, you know, your favorite tech websites, or browse through your social networks. But uh, offering that capability to be able to browse through the core um, information of the site is vital across all devices. So when it comes to your product, you really need to think, you know, what is the core essence that needs to be consistent um, across multiple or all devices and which part should be dif differentiated based on the context of use. So to uh, summarize it all, uh, I want to get, uh, I, I want to show you a, sh a short uh, clip from Seinfeld, which um, just says it beautifully. So, so I love this, this video too, because I think what it beautifully shows is the idea that, you know, you really need to take a holistic approach, which is, you know, what I've been talking about throughout this entire presentation. And you really need to think about the big picture before you start breaking it down to the different parts. And in our case, it's the different devices. So you really want to think, you know, about your entire ecosystem of devices and figure out the end-to-end -end story that you're trying to tell and the different relationships between these devices. And only then when you have that understanding and you have that mental model of how you want your users to use your product across different devices, you can go and, you know, break it down to each and every device and build an amazing experience per device. But in order to do that, you need to start from the ecosystem approach. And, you know, when we look on the world today, it is still this kind of world. You know, when you develop a, uh, a product, you mostly think about this set of devices. But pretty soon, it's going to be these. And there's going to be so many more devices and so many more opportunities. And the earlier you start thinking about the bigger story and the, the earlier you start practice thinking about, you know, what is the role that each device, you know, plays and really understanding what people do along different contexts, you're going to be able to scale better because you, you are already thinking about that family in that way. So um, with that, I just want to summarize uh, what we talked about and the main takeaways from this talk. So I started, you know, with the basic question uh, of does size matter uh, as a proxy for designing multi-device experiences? And the answer is yes, of course, size matters. But uh, it's never just about the size. Uh, of course, you know, when you have different size of devices, you have different limitations and opportunities in terms of how you can design the interface. But it's not just that. And for our discussion, family matters too. And not only that it matters as well, it actually matters more. Um, because beyond the size of each device, you really need to think about how they connect to each other as a family, as an ecosystem. And within that analysis, what matters most is the context. Uh, and what you really need to strive for is understand, you know, the different contexts along which your users uh, use your product and uh, selectively adapt your experience uh, only where they are relevant and, you know, and providing the, real, the right thing at the right place at the right time. Because this is really where understanding how people use your product along the different devices and how different devices convey different patterns and habits and, uh, and, use, uh, uh, and use types really shine. So if there is one thing I want you to remember is that context is king and you really need to think about that. And as you analyze you know, your uh, product design uh, along these different contexts, you need to ask yourself which kind of design approaches fit these contexts. Is it a consistent one? And, you know, as I said, consistent doesn't mean identical, right? So it's, you know, consistent, but not necessarily 100% the same across devices. Uh, and we saw Google search and, uh, uh, and uh, Trulia and Hulu Plus as examples for that. Um, do you have continuous use cases where, you know, users can benefit from continuous experiences 
and we talked about Amazon Kindle and Google Chromecast and all recipes. And also, do you have complementary uh, use cases or portions of the experience? And we, we saw uh, a lot of examples like uh, uh, Real Racing uh, 2, and we saw uh, other examples from KL Dartboard and the second screen experience and Nest and, and others. So really think if that also fits your product. And the thing is, you know, even if you're a small company or a startup and you have limited resources, um, oh, sorry, I skipped a few slides. I'm sorry. Um, so even uh, if you're a startup um, and um, you have limited resources, you need to think big. You need to plan for the bigger uh, product. And you can, you know, launch it in stages. You can start small. You can start with one device. You can start with limited feature sets across multiple devices. You know, this is really up to the product and the target audience and a lot of other considerations. But still, think big, because this is the, the, the only way that I know, uh, at least, to change the world. And this is what we're all here for, right? So thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your time.